welcome everyone. Um, my name is Patrick Paul Walsh. Um, I'm a professor of international development in University College Dublin, but I'm on succumbent to the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network with responsibility for education as vice president of education and director of the SDG Academy. Um, so this is a, a UN HLPF virtual side event. Um, and it's a very, I think, important topic because uh, we know with the digital transformation and the sort of transformations that we need to achieve sustainable development, and particularly with new regulations coming in from government and hopefully a lot more regulation coming in, um, there's going to be quite an upheaval uh, in the, the labor market and in the nature, hopefully, of products and services because they're all going to be inclusive and green. Um, for this reason, uh, looking at history, we've seen a true a globalization over time or even with the breakup of the Soviet Union, that in times of structural change, there has to be quite a lot of upskilling and reskilling of workers and of the labor force. Um, and that's what we're just going to talk about today. So we're going to talk and the, the sort of team I hope will emerge through um, people talking today is that sometimes there's a lack of coordination when government step in to do training, when professional bodies and corporate step in, when vocational colleges step in, when academics and higher education start to orientate towards the, the skills of the future, sometimes there's a, a lot of um, a lack of coordination. And, and I, I guess what we're trying to promote today is that when we're facing the digital transformation and sustainability transformation, uh, let's have a bit of coherence uh, between government, corporates, academia, vocational colleges, because it will go a long way to giving uh, labor market resilience and resilience to companies and to people. So that's the nature of today. Um, so it's called Partnerships in Labor Force Resilience, the imperative of education and upskilling in digital and sustainability skills. Um, so today's, um, when we applied for this side event uh, was SDSN and Build Skills. Uh, and Build Skills is a European Commission project which has many partners and Maria We'll talk to it because she's the manager of that project. Um, but this is the idea that I've just said, uh, that we would look at the Green New Deal. We'd look at sort of commitments to net zero, particularly in the construction sector. We'd look at skill gaps in the sort of training courses and professional bodies and vets. Um, we'd actually define new skills and competencies and we update courses. And then we'd actually make recommendations for some sort of European certification uh, across, if you like, national level uh, certification for this particular sector. Um, so this is something that the European Commission obviously is concerned about um, and wants to do something about, but it's also uh, a passion for SDSN and some of the partners here that we want to upskill and reskill uh, companies and the labor force, labor supply and labor demand. Uh, we want to basically help them adapt and uh, be very innovative around the, the structural change that is happening and can be happening in the in our labor markets and and product markets and services globally. Um, so I'm not going to um, the speakers today are are really high profile and they have wonderful bios, but I'm actually not going to read them out. So in the chat, I'm going to put in the link obviously to, to, to today, and you can see their pick and bio and their detail. So I think it's more important that they introduce themselves and to do their presentations and we have time for questions. Um, and also you can watch the chat as we go along uh, because we will ask, um, we will give resources for each speaker. But more importantly, if you want to put questions in the chat, I will try and synthesize those and ask one question per speaker as we, uh, as we move along. But hopefully we'll leave 30 minutes at the end for people to ask questions and have a, a bit of dialogue. Um, so you're not able to unmute yourself. I've blocked that. But in the Q&A, when you put up your hand, we'll unmute you and you'll be able to talk. And, uh, and that's the way we're going to do it. OK, so without fur further ado, um, our first speaker is from the European Commission, um, Shamur uh, Deligo. And he's, um, he, he runs a wonderful education for climate um, community uh, that I'm part of. Um, but it's, it's just going to let's uh, I'll give the floor to Shamur to explain um, his passions and what he'd like to say to us today. So welcome, Trevor. Thank you so much, uh, Paul. I hope you can hear me. It's okay, yeah, right? Good. Okay, I will start uh, showing my screen at that point. Uh, 
and start my presentation. So I, I, I prepared an insane amount of slides, so I will try to go through very rapidly. But first of all, I wanted to thank you very much for that invitation on you in particular, Paul. Uh, I think it's important. And I'm trying to, I'm going to try to explain and to give you a sort of comprehensive view of what the EU is doing when it comes to uh, green education. Uh, it won't be easy because there are many things. I will have a, a stronger focus, of course, on the Education for Climate Coalition, you can see behind me, which is a, a program I'm uh, directly involved in. Uh, as you can see, we've, uh, I'm playing with words a bit in my title. Uh, well, Samuel, you're, you're not full screen on the slides. Exactly, but... exactly. Yeah. I've just used that. So I'm playing a bit with words in, in the title because I, I do believe, I think it's a, it's a good starting point is that uh, when it comes to education and training, uh, supporting uh, the uh, transition, in fact, we should also think about what should happen in terms of transition in education because that's what it is about. I mean, when we talk about green education, uh, it's very much about uh, education transformation. But let me start off from, from the beginning. I will be very short, but you know that, of course, what we're developing in the EU is framed uh, mostly uh, within the European Green Deal. Of course, having such a very ambitious target of the climate neutrality by 2050, at the start, this is where, of course, we know we got to adapt uh, our industry uh, economies to uh, the necessity of that, uh, of that goal. But it's also very much about adaptation of the of the very society, uh, and this is where education from the very beginning in the Green Deal uh, was tackled. Uh, because if uh, we don't have, of course, the professionals, which is what we're going to talk about uh, today, uh, having the right skills to be able to uh, to do the jobs, some who are not in that at the moment, by the way, uh, we will we won't get there. But it's also very much about the citizens we want to have to adapt to the necessity of climate change. Uh, so all the pro a lot of programs in the European Commission nowadays have good targets that are clearly uh, identifying, of course, a green transition as a, as a key target, which is the case of one, as you can see, the European Education Era, which is uh, framing what can be done at European level, uh, reminding, and let me remind that very clearly from the very beginning, we're talking about the European Union, where education is of national competence. So it's very clear, GD already is applying, which means that uh, they maybe concretely member states are doing what they want uh, as regards education and training, rightly. But that does not mean that we, can, of course, try to converge towards common objectives and have common initiatives. Uh, uh, Paul was insisting on that thing, really, that's music to my ear, on the key necessity uh, and value of collaboration. I would say that we need more than ever uh, to collaborate because we're all facing and problem at the same moment. The challenges we're tackling in all education training systems are the same. We're not at the same uh, path in terms of development, so we can learn a lot from each other. Also, in, in order to uh, avoid maybe repeating sometimes the uh, some mistakes and trying to have a stronger impact. So what you can see on that slide is a bit that the most important one is a bit uh, a sort of comprehensive view of what we can do, the various tools we're using, some are political, such as the uh, Council Recommendation, some are more methodological, like Green Comp, which is the European Sustainability Competence Framework. Communities of practice, and I will end my presentation, but that are uh, coming in very uh, hot, uh, to, and I will explain why. It's absolutely key to my view. There are working groups at the EU level also, and you can see there's research which is being developed. I will insist a lot on that because there are some interesting, important outcomes we got to consider in order to think about the policies we want to develop. I'm coming from the Joint Research Center in the European Commission, which is to make it short the scientific department of the European Commission. Uh, those financial instruments, of course, to incentivize green education, such as Horizon Erasmus. So let's start by this one. Seems to be a boring document, but it's not. Uh, we need it, and uh, it was adopted in June 2022 in the EU, meaning that all the member states uh, told themselves basically, yes, guys, we should consider green education as a priority, which means we need to unlock certain investment, but also to do things differently. That's the interesting thing there, because that council recommendation on learning for the transition on sustainable development, oof, title is a bit long, yeah, uh, is about also very much what's happening when it comes to teaching and learning. And it goes into that level of details, which is why it's interesting that on the left, for instance, you know, is, uh, that learning for sustainability is learner-centered, hands-on, based on real life experiences. So experimental learning is absolutely key. 
we need to empower the youth, et cetera, et cetera. So it means at the end, to go back to my point at the very beginning, we need certainly to tackle uh, trans education transformation because certainly we're not there yet. I mean, most of education system, but training sector or so has to adapt to new ways of doing things. This is where I will uh, uh, go uh, now in a minute. So I was talking about working groups. So what is a working group? Basically, you take a representative from all the member states. They come together with experts and together they're thinking about uh, solutions, which is always a very good idea. So there's one on school learning for sustainability. So here, let's be clear, it's the focus is on schools, but it's very interesting. Also because, and I will say that in a couple of minutes, uh, it's not because it's cool, but it could not be interesting for training sector vocational uh, education because we are facing most of it exactly the same sort of, uh, of challenges. So a lot of research is being produced. We'll go uh, rapidly. They're doing what they call input papers. You've got there a lot of uh, possibilities for input papers they've been doing. So it's uh, a anxiety, uh, uh, curriculum design, uh, uh, teacher education, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's one particular, which is a short one on vocational training. I, I, I took that quote. I think it's a good start. Uh, about the challenge of combining the two training modes of in school and in company uh, on, on working on synergy is absolutely key because it can be a very strong catalyst for the development of competences. I do agree with that. <laughs> another one, I have another working group on the vocational education on training uh, on the green transition, which is led by DG AMP in the uh, European Commission. And here again, it's interesting. It's not a research. It's more a compilation of the uh, very inspiring uh, 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 practices. Uh, so it's very interesting. It's mapping a lot of uh, these very interesting activities. I, I've underlined a quote there from the report uh, another, another time, which is saying a bit the same thing. Success of ET depends on close cooperation between two learning venues, what's happening in school, what's happening in the companies. Uh, one thing I wanted to share with you, and I will uh, now uh, focus a bit on outcomes of research, uh, just to avoid so our congratulations process uh, explaining that all we're doing is it's just fine and going into the right direction. So let me first start by the fact that yes, things are improving. There is a way of raising, there is no doubt about that. A lot of member states are developing super interesting policies. I should say that there has been an, an extraordinary acceleration since the pandemic. But that being said, it does not mean that we're going to stop because there's still a lot to be done. If you see there, for instance, on that report, that's interesting. It was being asked to the uh, the people taking the the, uh, the poll. I mean, if you consider the following statements more uh, most accurately, uh, the one that most accurately reflect the situation in which is your country regarding how green skills uh, are understood. And what you can see that most of the country they got there's no sheer understanding of green skills. Uh, another one is that one, which is also interesting, is that if you focus on the uh, and the situation which regards to inclusion of co more uh, common green elements in VET programs and curricula, you see that most of them are in the process of developing this thing. So still work to be done. I will now um, stop for a minute on that very interesting uh, study that has been uh, uh, released very recently, uh, a REDC report, which has been taking stock of a situation in 39 countries uh, now that we know that there's a trend, a very positive trend, what's happening really? Uh, where are we uh, regarding building competences on supporting teachers in school? And uh, I, I shared that slide with you because I think it's a very good thought. Uh, it was in the introduction of a report, and I think we we'll all agree on that, which is we need to have sustainability competences really embedded in the curriculum, but in a holistic way. We also need to train the trainers. It's always a, a very uh, important leverage, of course. Teachers and school leaders need to receive appropriate training. And we need to learn also uh, the, to understand that learning for sustainability requires a whole institution approach. So that's the starting point. Are we there? Not fully. And that's what I will uh, share. There are very positive outcomes. We can say, for instance, that uh, how of the system that were scanned uh, have uh, sustainability-related uh, learning objectives for teachers in their education programs. Which means, by the way, that also half, for half, it's not the case. Um, the support of a world school approach exists in mostly in most of the countries, but it's not the case for all of them. And then 
It's not because you've got guidance, for instance, that it's turned into concrete actions. So we've got to monitor very closely this, and that's important. That one is important for the discussion of today, Paul, I think. Uh, sustainability competences based on the comp report. Issue, you see that graph that we have a bit of an issue with futures literacy, but also with individual and collective action. But in fact, it's not individual or collective action. It's going to more granularity. We see that individual action is quite well tackled by teachers in general and trainers. When it comes to collective actions, it's not that much the case. So maybe because some teachers or don't believe or not in the position to really emphasize correctly collective actions when in fact it's a key leverage when it comes to change at society level. So this, I, I think I invite you to read that report. It's interesting. I just shared with you the conclusion that are there in green. If you want a positive trend, there's still a lot to do for what's regard teachers training, that's for sure. But also for financial and non-financial support for specific school activities, which means that you might have a national scheme that has been decided, you divide the guidance or whatever, but to turn that into reality with the learners really on the field, you need to have financial and non-financial support that it's not always there. And you see the last sentence, which is very clear, the need for comprehensive policies to promote sustainability at European school or stronger actions to support teachers and schools, et cetera. So still work to be done, a very positive trend, but we can't just stop there. Uh, Erasmus, of course, is a very important uh, financial tool. Uh, by the way, the uh, the funding has been doubled, so of course it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a very good way to incentivize a lot of green education projects. As you can see, there are various goals, bonding goals versus green, again, as I was explaining before. Erasmus Plus has developed this. I think it's a very interesting new tool that has been developed at uh, UU level, which are teachers' academies. And I've just listed there all the teachers' academies who are uh, um, uh, focusing on green education. But here again, everything is online, fully transparent. You just go on the on the website you will uh, uh, find this green comp as you know i we were saying before that uh, sometimes there's not a common understanding about what we're talking about on green skills which is true uh, so my uh, colleagues from the uh, grc uh, but also from the dg act develop uh, 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 first a, a 38 map that was out there and to show clearly that green skills was uh, in most of the way and most of the time used without having Amer a proper definition. Amer, we're, going, we're going way over time now. So, um, okay, sorry. Yeah. So I stop here if you want. Oh, no, no, you, you can conclude. <laughs> okay, so I conclude. So, Green Comp, I invite you a bit, as you know, 12 competences on, on the four competence areas. So, it's a very interesting tool. You can join the Green Comp community, which is fully dedicated to that hosted by the Education for Climate Coalition. You can also read that read, uh, study, the last one on case studies on implementation of green comp. You can play with the green comp game that we've developed in the community of practice. And then I finish, Paul, at that point, on education from climate, because that's something to you, which is uh, something we should uh, praise and, and, and really uh, promote and support, which is how can we have tools that give us the possibility to uh, strengthen our collaboration. That was Paul was explaining before. But this is what we're trying to do. Uh, with 7,000 members then uh, in uh, the Education for Climate, which is gathering uh, people like us, uh, education stakeholders, let's say, coming from administration, but also association, NGOs, or whatever, on educators and students. And together, we can, okay, we've got an online collaborative platform. We, we can do a lot of things, of course, which is uh, sharing ideas, information, co-creating, uh, uh, bringing co-creation process and things like that. But we're also meeting on frequent basis, exactly as we're doing with uh, Paul today, so we're doing on a monthly basis with CAFE. I invite you to join the next one that will be the last one before the summer break. Next week, for instance, we will focus on interesting things. The commission is developing a MOOC at the moment on sustainability education. So we're gathering support and the community will be able to give it. The Green Comp is doing the same thing. I'm doing talks also with experts. You recognize someone you know in the center of that image, for instance. And I think it's important also to give a floor to the people like Paul who are involved for years in such a topic to share and compare a bit our thoughts. Uh, and then I will finish here, Paul, uh, because that's what's happening this summer. Uh, I invite you, if you are involved in a green education project, to share it with us because we launch a call as uh, every summer that will end uh, eight, uh, in, on the 8th of September. Yeah, that's it. Uh, a call for an innovative green education project um, to focus very much, of course, on uh, innovation, uh, give visibility to this project, on map out what's happening there, 
uh, because it's uh, very important to support uh, the transformation, as I was saying before, of education system. I, I got uh, I did a talk, Paul, with an interesting guy who is a, 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 a geneticist by training, Paul Tadei, who is a founder of a Learning Planet. He was telling me that education systems are not very, I could say, evolutive uh, systems. Uh, uh, so, uh, but the thing is that if a system and this system don't evolve at the path of the, their environment, they, they might become obsolete very, very soon. So let's try to change that. Okay. So thanks very much. So and unfortunately, um, I'm going to, that was 20 minutes and we were trying to stick to five. <laughs> so, <laughs> but anyway, to be honest, Tremere, I, I can't highlight how important this education for climate community is and all the great work you do. So we are going to share the slides and then those scans there to join the community, I would say to everyone, uh, European or not European, uh, to get involved and to come in and to share their um so it's, it's a great community because it's people from all um from all um sectors um so one kind of before i move on to the next bit one kind of comment it's interesting tremor was very much focusing on trainers and teachers and and people in schools but actually in ireland in the climate act all people in government and in universities have to go uh, have to actually go back to school and do sustainability training. So the first step was actually to train the European Commission. I don't know how you'd feel about that, but everyone in the European Commission and the bureaucracies and uh, you know in the departments of education down to the the staff and in, in HEAs and vocational college have to get trained first, and then they can go into the schools and uh, redo the curriculum and and so on and so forth. But I think it's an interesting approach. Um, so our next speaker is going to be Maria Nakova. She's project manager of the Build Skills Academy. Um, so it's a, a, a kind of co-organizer of today and manager of, of strategic development and it's clean tech Bulgaria. So I'll hand it over to you, Maria. Um, but we'll try and um, stick to around five minutes. I think what we'll do is that we'll on spotlight you. That will give you an indication. That will give you an indication that time's up. Wow, ladies and gentlemen, it's great the honor to be here with you and exchange on the, the super important topic of how to make the world more resilient, starting from skills and education. In my capacity of project leader of the Build Skills Academy project, it is a great privilege to share with you the key insights from our center of vocational excellence. Education is the key to reduce inequalities and to empower people. And it lies in, in the core and the basis of achieving all the 17 sustainable development goals. Not, not only the fourth one, because they, uh, the education and training will ensure living in a sustainable, fair, decent, inclusive and peaceful world. Diverse lifelong learning opportunities are the strongest assets to foster innovation and progress within the society. A growing number of people worldwide need to update and improve their knowledge, skills, and competencies to fill the gap between their formal education and training and the needs of the fast changing labor force ecosystem. Simultaneously, workers are facing unprecedented changes in how work is organized. In addition, task profiles and skills requirements are changing fundamentally due to the digital and green transition. And I'm very much grateful to the presentation of our partner from Education for Climate for sharing all the political insights behind to keep up with all those global challenges, we need to work in a very synergetic and cooperative manner. And it is essential that the quadruple helix function well. So we combine at one and the same place, academia, private organizations, civil society organization, and the governmental level. Because we need to have them all to work together to develop sustainable, equitable, inclusive to all and resilient, so, uh, resilient solutions. We need to learn how to nurture talent in vocational education and training, and how to create and adapt the curricula of the vocational education and training and professional education, and how to apply our newly gained know how on a daily basis. Stepping on this, the European Commission 
uh, decided to create a network of centers of vocational excellence. Uh, it is a European initiative funded by the Erotics Plus program aimed at enhancing the quality and innovation of vocational education and training through creation of, of the network. The centers of vocational excellence are designed to bring together vocational education and training providers, businesses, social partners, and other stakeholders, in particular industry or sector-specific businesses. The goals of the centers are to improve the quality of the program, making them workable for a very specific and task-related knowledge. The goal was operate at regional level, but also um, facilitate connections among European regions. You can see at the map that there are centers of vocational excellence covering the entire Europe and of course beyond, enabling the sharing and knowledge of the effective solutions to ensure the collective benefit of the European, but also world. Uh, of the world education society. And Build Skills is one of the, the approved centers of vocational excellence. And I'm really happy that uh, I can share our insights and the greater understanding that we achieve. In Build Skills, we have 17 well known and prominent European based organizations that unite forces. The consortium is led by Clean Tech Bulgaria. And we're together diving deep in identifying the missing transitional skills, those specific green and digital skills that will support the transition and ensure resilience in one of the most important and structural defining sectors of the European economy, the construction sector. We're revising the existing curriculum both in terms of content and form, with the respect to the new skills required, aiming and including their latest developments and needs of the skills ecosystems. We are elaborating a list of skills and competencies for different occupations and, of course, different EQF level, uh, levels based on the taxonomy of green skills of ESCO and stepping onto uh, the gaining knowledge to create the build and rich skills methodology. Here you can see some of the key project results. And those that are marked here are already achieved and we're moving forward to achieve the others. The build skills targets of creating a pan-European certification framework for recognition of skills and competences responding to the emerging needs between transition. And our big ambition is to set an internationally recognized standard for vocational excellence in delivering transitional skills. In order to achieve this high level ambition, we have united forces with the leading policymakers, educators, educators, and trainers from different domains. And we are working on finding beyond the project solutions to validate the short term educational path. I will briefly uh, in, in, include here some words regarding this short-term educational path, namely the micro-credentials that are the key innovative solution with various usage and benefits because it happens to be uh, our kind of one of all-purpose solution with various uses. Uh, for different domains and for confronting all the problems related to education, training, and labor market systems. Micro credentials do not replace the traditional qualifications. Instead, they can complement traditional qualifications and serve as a lifelong learning opportunity to all. If used according to the high quality standards, they're Functions, scope, duration, and delivery can allow micro credentials to meet new skills needs in a targeted and flexible way, complementing existing qualifications and supporting it effectively the transition. It is essential to understand that the key role of the micro credentials will surely bring us from to the future of skills. And of course, now it is our time to. Uh, move forward and to enrich 12 courses, starting the piloting, and then, of course, to further uh, try to, to support this in new domains, new qualifications, and new opportunities.
Uh, I definitely believe that uh, a, a lot more can be done. And again, the cooperation is the key. In all those processes, the Build Skills Academy and Center of Vocational Excellence will play a role to build a skilled, adaptable, and inclusive workforce capable of meeting the demands of the rapidly changing world. You know, I try to be as brief as possible. Of course, you can find more, more information on our website and also on the profiles of LinkedIn and also Facebook that you can see at your screen. Thank you very much, and I will be happy to answer questions. Great, Maria. Um, so that was a that, that's excellent, excellent project. So there was a question at Tramir, but it was just about well, what do you mean by putting sustainability into curriculum or how exactly do you do it? But I guess what we're finding to answer the question for you, I guess what we're finding in this project that if you actually work with the professional bodies in construction and with the vocational colleges and actually say, well, what are the skill gaps that we have to bring in and how do we define them? Um, and then how do we update the courses and how do we update the certification? You really see how the, the legislation, if you like, hits the ground and it's not easy. So basically, um, you know, the professionals have to do this themselves and it's actually not an easy exercise at all, but we will have for construction, at least we will have the handbook or the toolkit to help vocational colleges right across Europe do exactly that for all the different components of the construction sector. And hopefully it's a useful tool when we move on to other sectors. Um, so the next speaker is Elena Pruden from uh, UNITAR, and she's a senior specialist as on everything to do, I guess, with implementing the 2030 agenda. So, um, so Maria, if you want share, I'm only allowing one share at a time. So there you go. And um, Elena can, can share, or, or maybe, do you have slides? Yeah. Um, Elena, you're not unmuted, so were you made a co-host when you came in? Yeah. Okay, so we need to remove the spotlight, co-host Elena, let her speak. This is great now. Um, yeah, you got it, yeah. That works. Now, now we're all set. Yeah, very good. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So I, I will be quick and short. Essentially, um, my contribution would be around uh, the need that we have been discussing, in fact, in partnership with many um, UN and other organizations uh, in the context of a UN SDG UN SDG Leon partnership that brings together more than 60 organizations, UN agencies, uh, universities, and other stakeholders. And in fact, SDSN is an active member. So we've been discussing uh, how to best meet the needs in terms of sustainable development learning within the private sector, and in particular for small and medium-sized enterprises. And we created a task force where we had really good conversations and a few thoughts that I'm going to share now, they emerge from this work. And in particular, you will also listen to the presentation from UNIDO right after uh, me, from Nikki. So we've been having this collaboration and discussions led uh, by um, SDSN, UNIDO, and UNITAR with a broader group. Um, and what we've seen, so my contribution will be a little bit more conceptual, but I will link it to the presentation on build the skills and what was shared now, that is a more specific example of how it could work. Um, what we've realized is that, in fact, you cannot meet these needs without a real public-private partnership. Um, and what we mean by this essentially is that uh, both public authorities and private sector have an important role to play in filling this need. Um, and uh, so we, we focused initially a bit more um, narrowly um, on training and learning, but then we've expanded the scope and started thinking more ab about industrial policies. And of course, UNIDO also 
issued uh, this year a new industrial development report that calls for the new year of industrial policy, emphasizing how important it is in the context of current transi transitions and the need for it to support SDG transformations, to be more forward-looking, account for the mega trends such as demographic transitions, energy transitions, uh, industrial, fourth industrial revolution, um, and um, also the rebalancing of the global production chains, uh, and also emphasizing the importance of collaboration uh, between private and uh, public stakeholders, as well as the importance of coordination and collaboration between countries and industrial authorities. And so we went back a little bit, uh, we did a literature review and um, essentially we, we sort of, we've been really building on this by showing and emphasizing how learning plays an important role as, as well as the quality of institutions in economic development. And uh, we've been lo also looking at the concepts uh, um, that have been highlighted and the ideas brought by different researchers on how in fact knowledge generation is a result of interactions involving these multiple stakeholders from business firms and public um, training and research institutions uh, to technical societies, trade unions and communities of practice. And so we've also clearly seen that there is a need for public investment in knowledge generation uh, uh, with um, information and knowledge generation being a, um, a, a non-rival public good. Um, and then we sort of um, draw on this idea of capabilities. Uh, so there is an ILEO colleague who has been developing this concept on capabilities, defining it as feasible patterns and processes of productive transformation, covering both possible options for economic diversification, but also collective competencies. So it's not narrowly productive capacities, it's really more uh, lies in the sphere of learning knowledge um, and uh, she also called on more coordinated and comprehensive approach to developing learning strategies at the national level, where you have to bring different stakeholders together. And we are also looking at how this could be coordinated more at the global and regional levels. And so here, I think the idea was to emphasize, in addition to the need to develop advanced technological concepts and skills, also to work with social belief systems um, in this uh, approach, and then also consider different types of engagement, learning and connection with production, such as apprenticeships, for example, education and training institutions and supporting meta institutions. And so drawing on this knowledge produced by many different uh, researchers, uh, we sort of, we've been thinking about this concept that we call capabilities for the future hub where we would like to bring together different stakeholders from uh, business and SMEs to industrial authorities, vocational, technical vocational uh, education and training and higher education uh, with the idea of connecting the dots. I think what we feel that knowledge may be emerging, it may exist um, some in some countries, some stakeholders may be doing something, but there is um, an interest in leveraging the collective power, bringing them together for greater impact and global public good and so the idea is also to harness this available expertise and sometimes learning content and products that may already be available by bringing together pedagogical expertise and industry specific knowledge from the private sector. Um, and then uh, with the idea of providing more coherent learning pathways that on the one hand would be aligned with these forward looking industrial uh, transformations and uh, um, industrial policies and economic transformations and also uh, that could be tailored to specific learners' needs. Um, and then um, to uh, finalize my presentation, essentially what we are thinking um, uh, together also with uh, Paul, SDSN, with UNIDO and other stakeholders, that would be um, interesting to have, uh, to really address this social beliefs um, aspect through some kind of uh, foundational learning on which we could work together. That's very important. It's the change in mindsets. Uh, and at the same time, to help provide access to quality learning uh, for different industries and skills. So build the skills construction sector would be one great example. Uh, but the idea is really to work together by bringing different partners to develop these coherent learning pathways and show how it can be possible. And also promote the knowledge sharing across different uh, institutions. 
Um, and I think I will stop here. I thank you everyone for your attention. I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Hey, thank you, Lena. That's excellent. Um, that builds on Maria's uh, work, and of course, we're all partners in this. Um, excellently. And so, I didn't see any questions in the chat, but it's an excellent presentation, very clear. Um, so we'll move on to uh, Unido, the other partner. Um, Nikki, uh, Rodukakis. 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 Very good. Um. I'm Irish. I can. <laughs> so, That's fine. That I no should, worries. I should. Have, I'm going to practice that in future. Um, Don't worry. Cap, uh, capacity development and policy advice unit. Um, you have the floor. All right. All right. Can you see my screen? Yeah, it's not on full. Yes. Okay. Just um, maybe full. All right. Yeah, perfect. All right. Okay. Uh, all right. So um, as Paul mentioned, I am I work for UNIDO, the Industrial Development Organization. And um, I will be briefly speaking about the, the interdependence between future ready industrial policies and future ready skills and how they are inter interdependent and um, hinge on each other. Uh, and uh, I will briefly touch also on the Industrial Development Report, which is UNIDO's flagship uh, publication, which as Elena just mentioned, we just released. Um, so UNIDO is a specialized UN agency that promotes inclusive and sustainable industrialization and industrial development in alignment with SDG 9. SDG 9, being building resilient infrastructure, promoting inclusive and sustainable industrialization and fostering innovation. Um, so as mentioned here, this is the, the, the cover of the um, IDR, the Industrial Development Report 2024, um, entitled Turning Challenges into Sustainable Solutions and the New Era of Industrial Policy. I will only briefly touch on it, but um, the link is in my presentation. I'm happy to share it in the chat. It's a very, very um, useful publication uh, based on, on, on data and um, with very interesting recommendations plus regional focuses. Um, so uh, the IDR um, concludes that four megatrends are reshaping our world as we know it. It's of course the energy transition, Global, global rebalancing, so the shift in economic power um, within, within the global sphere, the fourth industrial revolution, of course, digitalization, and then demographic transitions, um, the aging of the population, um, in, especially in, in uh, developed countries. Um, so in addition to the poly crisis, which the COVID recovery, um, the armed conflicts, climate catastrophes, all of these are, of course, reshaping our world. Um, considering that we're facing these unprecedented challenges, we need viable solutions. And um, the IDR concludes that industry could be a very important driver um, to reaching especially the 2030 agenda. Um, and the IDR definitely shows that the industrial sector plays a crucial role. Um, it's key for uh, economic development, um, so SDG 8, um, uh, the, we found that 140 out of 210 growth episodes in the last 50 years were directly linked to manufacturing. Um, industry also indirectly contributes to the SDGs um, by fostering economic growth, by promoting job creation, supporting the energy transition, so SDG 7, um, and of course, responsible production and decarbonization. So um, one third of global CO2 emissions can be reduced through industrial de decarbonization. Um, industry also creates jobs, reducing poverty. So it, it feeds also into SDG one. And um, the IDR found that for each job created in manufacturing, 2.2 jobs are created in other industries, service sector, et cetera. 
Um, so it's, it's industry is a very important driver. Um, and of course, industrial development doesn't just happen on its own. It needs, it requires modern, new industrial policies. Um, it, and it, uh, they, these, what is, what are modern industrial policies? They're based on, they're collaborative, they are SDG oriented, regionally coordinated, and they're future ready. Well, what do we mean by future ready? What are future ready industrial policies? Um, they're designed to promote sustainable development. Um, they're, they promote economic resilience and are based, of course, on technological advancement. Um, and cultivating future ready skills within the workforce is key to the success of future ready industrial policies. And that's how they, the two are interdependent and reinforce each other. Um, then, of course, what do we mean by future ready skills? Future ready skills are technical skills. So proficiency, for example, in AI and robotics, data analytic, analytics, renewable energy systems. This ensures that the workforce can, can operate and manage and innovate within these advanced, these technologically advanced systems. Soft skills, competencies such as critical thinking, problem solving, or um, creative, creative solutions, communication. These also enhance the ability of individuals to collaborate, adapt to new roles as, as technologies change, and also to navigate complex um, workplace scenarios. And also future ready skills are adaptive skills. Our world is changing at a very rapid, a rapid pace as uh, are the technological changes. And adaptive skills are the capacity for continuous learning. So lifelong learning, basically. Um, so uh, workers can adapt to new technologies and to new processes. So effective industrial policies provide the framework and resources that are necessary for skill development, while a properly skilled uh, workforce is crucial for implementing the future ready um, uh, industrial policies. Um, what what are the key elements of future ready industrial policies? Innovation, technological advancement, sustainability, the green transition, um, and of course economic resilience and inclusivity. So um, the realization of these goals, they are all contingent on the workforce being proficient in using new technologies and driving innovation. So innovation and technological advancement are, of course, major drivers of economic growth. Um, achieving these goals means we need to make sure that our, our wor workforce can implement them. And not only in advanced countries, even more so in industrializing and emerging economies. Um, for example, the integration of AI in manufacturing processes you need engineers, you need data scientists, technicians who possess the necessary knowledge and expertise to operate all these systems. Um, so we need to also keep in mind, or policymakers need to keep in mind, the potential benefits of technological investments cannot be fully realized without a skilled workforce. Um, future ready industrial policies also prioritize sustainable development and the green transition. Um, achieving sustainability, for example, the reduction of carbon emissions or transitioning to renewable energy systems um, calls for a workforce that is skilled in green technologies and in sustainable practices. And that's where this hub that Elena was speaking about comes in. How do we um, teach these skills to those who need it most? Um, and the expansion of the renewable energy sector, for example, depends on the available, uh, availability of trained staff, of professionals who can, uh, for example, even, even just operate the solar or wind energy systems. Um, and uh, that's why it's so crucial. That's why this focus, this very intense focus on, on skills development, capacity development, um, future ready industrial 
policies also prioritize economic resilience and inclusivity. Uh, that means that um, everyone, all segments of society, marginalized groups will have access or should have access to skill development opportunities. This promotes um, social equity, and it also expands the talent pool for firms to have enough workforce. And as we all know, there's a lack of workforce, I feel like all over the world, for sure in advanced countries. Um, and through training programs, lifelong learning initiatives, apprenticeships, we can ensure that um, people get the, the skills they need um, and that workforce resilience and inclusivity is fostered. What are the challenges to the development of future ready skills? Of course, there's the gaps in education and training systems, um, especially in developing and emerging countries or also least developed countries. Um, we have then limited access to resources. And then there's also resistance, resistance to change in firms in particular who don't wanna make that extra investment to upgrade their technology and upskill their workers. Um, so some strategies to address these challenges um, are reform in education and training. That's where we need government to come in, policymakers to come in, um, the establishment of public-private partnerships between government, collaboration between government, firms, academia, to provide these skills, the necessary skills and the resources, provide real-world training opportunities, for example, and um, this can facilitate these public-private partnerships and facilitate the creation of, of these training programs, the relevant training programs that are responsive to industry needs and to and to the technological advancements that we're currently experiencing. And then uh, last but not least, lifelong learning and upskilling. Um, we need to be continuous, we need continuous learning due to this rapid uh, progress that we are that we are seeing on a daily basis due to AI and all these developments that are coming our way much faster than we can actually cope. So lifelong learning and upskilling will be crucial to ensure that um, workers can keep pace and can, can develop in a sustainable way. Uh, this brings me then to my last slide. Um, UNIDO has several skills and capacity development resources. Again, I'm more than happy to share the, the links. We have the statistics portal, which is crucial because without the right data, it's very difficult to come up with a solid industrial policy. So you need data, um, that's kind of the basics. And the statistics portal um, is very useful, offers a wide array of data, of manufacturing data, um, SDG9 related data, and so on. Uh, the Guido SDG9 Training Academy, that's a compilation of all our e-courses, free of charge, some are um, paid because they're in person, of manuals, guidelines, um, and so forth. That will be all, that's all being compiled and unified into one training academy portal that will be available in the next four weeks. So keep, keep your eyes glued on Unido's homepage. We also have the Learning and Knowledge Development Facility. They focus on TVET training. So um, very specific worker skills, um, and, and they have loads of projects that they're currently working on. They have lots of trainings, basic trainings, for example, basic mechanics, basic engineering, and so on. And um, there's lots of stories of people who benefited from trainings that they took. And last but not least, the Industrial Analytics Platform. You can track um, your country's SDG 9 performance. You can track your, SD, your, your country's manufacturing um, various components uh, compare your country. How how is your country doing compared to other countries, or to you know to benchmark your country against others in your region or internationally? So there's some very um, interesting things that we offer, and I welcome you all to take a look, and in particular also leaf through the industrial development report, which which was just released um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, it has very interesting infographics that I think will be useful 
for all of you. So, so thank, thank you for your attention. attention. If you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Thanks so much. Um, that was excellent. Um, so we'll keep it moving along. The, the, there was a, an interesting question about well, who pays for all of this, but I think what we're hearing in some sense is that the governments should be doing it and maybe paying for it. Maybe corporates have a strategy, so that'll be the next speaker. Um, people, individuals themselves, unfortunately, maybe should be upskilling and, and paying for that. But if we can minimize the cost and the quality on everyone, if we all coordinate, you know, um, on the resources and on the certification and on the cost, I mean, that's kind of the message we're trying to get across. So, um, the next speaker is Remos Steinmetz, and he's head of executive education and director in Swiss Re Institute. Um, and I think um, it's going to be very interesting getting uh, the more kind of corporate perspective, because honestly, I think none of us do anything without insurance. It doesn't matter whether you're a household or a corporate or a government. And the reinsurance actually insure the insurers. So it's um, a really important sector. Um, and it'll be very interesting to hear their approach to all of this uh, transformation or expected transformation to happen. So the floor is yours, um, Remo, and we're delighted you're here. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Paul. Ladies and gentlemen, it's really a great honor to be here participating in this crucial dialogue on sustainability, resilience, and the role of education and upscaling. Uh, as we look forward into the future, the insurance industry is actually also on a cliff of transformative change. It's a little bit also what Nikki outlined. Some changes are also uh, really um, uh, making us move. And this change is driven by technological advancements, also changing customer expectations, and of course, a heightened focus on sustainability. Um, the Swiss Insurance Association has conducted uh, uh, a study on skills of the future, which I'm referring to, and I'm also president of this uh, educational commission within the Insurance Association. And I will uh, just highlight a little bit the trends uh, which we see in the insurance industry, and you will also uh, realize that some of the trends Nikki already outlined on the mega trends are very similar. So. Uh, what we see is, is a lot of individualization of insurance products. Advanced data analytics enable us to offer highly personalized insurance solutions, tailoring also our services to meet specific needs and circumstances for each customer. The second big topic is that we are developing a health society. Uh, as we uh, see that life expectancy rises, wellness becomes a priority, the demand for health-related insurance services will increase. That's a big topic for us. Then the third topic, uh, also related to manufacturing, is that Internet of Things, connected devices will create opportunities for real-time monitoring and uh, as for our industry, proactive risk management and new services. The fourth topic is around uh, AI, AI will revolutionize various aspects of insurance from underwriting to claims processing, but also will enhance efficiency and make insurance uh, more affordable for a lot of people who have no access to insurance now, but also fostering innovation. The fifth trend we see is the establishment of digital ecosystems. So our offerings will be integrated into much broader digital ecosystems making collaboration with other industry and digital platforms necessary. This is also what uh, what Elena and also Nikki outlined is this, uh, this, this collaboration is getting uh, much more important between industries, but also uh, with governments. And then the six, and, uh, and that's uh, not the last uh, least one, uh, this is uh, actually keeping us very busy is climate change. And sustainability, this is a, is a big trend because we must adopt sustainable practices and develop new products that addresses environmental risks, but also support the energy transformation, which is uh, also creating new risks where, where industries would like to, to uh, also uh, hand over some of the risks to the balance sheet of insurance. And of course, uh, we are also very much aligned with the global push for sustainability. So if we see these big trends, uh, how does it now change the, the workforce or the trends for insurance professionals? And uh, you will also see some patterns my uh, my colleagues have already mentioned. 
So what we are, and I'm not going into very specific, uh, let's say, skills uh, and, uh, and, and let's say technical skills, but it's rather uh, transversal competencies with, with, where we see really uh, certain patterns which go through the whole value chain of insurance. And we have identified five uh, bigger competencies people need in the future. First is agile working. So flexibility and adaptability are really crucial. We must be able to respond swiftly to changes, technological advancements, and then of course certain methods are coming in, especially if uh, if a lot of pieces are driven by IoT. Uh, agile methods like Scrum will become much more integral to our operations. The second topic is uh, also related to, to the bigger trends I, I outlined. It's more cooperative and networked uh, working. Collaborations across uh, teams uh, with external partners, internal partners will drive innovation and efficiency. Sharing knowledge when fostering feedback culture will also be crucial in that networked working environment. Then the third uh, uh, transversal uh, competency we see is the customer-centric working. To understand and meet the client needs is essential. This requires, uh, of course, effective communication, but also empathy and the ability to map and enhance the customer journey. The fifth element is, uh, is digital working. Proficiency with digital tools and technologies is, is crucial. This includes, of course, data literacy in our area of insurance, but also cybersecurity, leveraging digital platforms to improve customer internet action and operational efficiency. And the fifth element which we are seeing uh, clearly as a transversal skill is that the people need to be responsible and uh, value-oriented at work. This uh, has really very high ethical standards uh, and of course sustainability must be at the forefront of what we do. We must also integrate corporate values into our daily operations and lead by example. So what are our recommendations out of these uh, competencies? What should we do now as, uh, as, uh, as, as industry to cultivate these skills? And we came up also with five um, uh, recommendations for implementation. First of all, educational programs, and uh, and some of uh, the speakers already uh, uh, said they're clear. There is an update on the curricula necessary in collaboration with educational institutions to incorporate these new skills in both initial education and then also in continuing professional development. Then corporate training, in our case, is also that we need to develop in-house programs, focuses on these transversal competencies I outlined, and also, does we also use real uh, world scenarios and simulations to enhance practical learning? The third aspect is leadership development. Uh, so, we need to train leaders to foster an agile, customer centric, but also sustainable culture, encouragement them to model ethical behavior, and also promote value oriented work practices. We think also that collaboration is uh, getting uh, more important, like Elena, Elena mentioned, so public-private partnership, uh, but also cross-industry collaboration is necessary uh, um, from strategic partnerships to leverage new te technologies, but also to transform, for instance, uh, the energy uh, uh, sector. And then fifth uh, field uh, to implement is continuous feedback and improvement, uh, implement mechanism for assessment of skills development and regularly also update programs based on the emerging trends we see and also technological advancements. To conclude, uh, our industry uh, is, is very similar to what we, ha we have heard. It's, it, it really faces significant change and the key to navigating this future lies in developing a skills and adaptable workforce. Uh, we believe that focusing on agile, cooperative, customer-centric, digital, and sustainable work practices, this is uh, the area where we would like to go and also ensure that we can cope the challenges and opportunities for 2030 and then, of course, until 2050, where we would have needed to achieve a lot of these changes. So uh, implementing this strategy will not only help the workforce to stay ahead, but also help us uh, to transform uh, uh, our industry, but also the real economy. Um, um, also, Nikki has outlined uh, into uh, a much more sustainable future. We believe that we 
together we can wait, make the world more resilient and uh, now one policy at a time. So thanks a lot, Paul. I yeah. give back to you. No, uh, excellent, Remo. And it's it's a, it's really good to um um to hear the, the you know it's not necessarily a common language, but uh, it's it's very uh, you know, Nikki and your talk and Elaine and Maria like it's it's very tight and Tremor very tight on the issue. So um somebody was asking about AI. Part of me thinks that on one hand, the whole verification of knowledge and what are we teaching and what is actually correct. Um, I think libraries are going to come back into their thing just to to verify things and you need academic and like this new knowledge base that we're creating is something that we have to proof against AI because it hallucinates and creates knowledge that's maybe not quite correct. Um, yeah. And then secondly, if, if we can do courses together much easier with AI, we can be much efficient, more and more efficient in our partnership. So even Elena was showing the app, for example, bringing us all into a common place to upskill and reskill across the different stakeholders. So I think AI nearly gives us more opportunities, um, but it does tell us that we have to cooperate and to be much tighter on the way we uh, create knowledge and disseminate knowledge, because um, obviously it, uh, it, it has to be verified, if you like, and um, uh, correct data and, and so on. Anyway, that was an excellent talk. Um, so it's music to hear. Somebody I normally work on the public side of things, so it's great to be so aligned to a, a private voice. Um, so that's excellent. Um, so our last speaker, and then is but not least, um, is Karen Shad from um, SDSM Malaysia, and she's director of education studies. Um, so she's obviously part of my my SDSN. So it's a, a joy to have you on. And then we're going to switch to um, teachers, I guess, right? Is that what we're going to talk about? Okay, great. Um, Thank you so much, Paul. Let me just get this open. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm conscious about the time, so I'll try to keep this very brief. Um, yeah. I'm going to take a, a little bit of a different, um, a different direction from uh, the previous speakers and share what I would call a a case study of sorts of uh, a project that we're doing here in Malaysia. Now, when um, SDSN's Asia office was set up here in Malaysia, Education for Sustainable Development was seen to be one of the very important flagship projects for us to undertake. And because we're based in Malaysia, we thought, okay, we know that the country's education system has, um, has been lamented for it problems and issues for a long time, but we needed to collect some evidence and present this in the form of a report. So we began with a study to determine what is the status of education for sustainable development in our national education system. And um, the findings were not very surprising, uh, but they, they, did, they were very useful in providing that evidence for us to then go to the Ministry of Education with. Now, among the main findings of the, the project was, number one, the biggest gap that we realized was that teachers really lacked awareness and understanding of what sustainable development is. And when the SDGs were adopted in, in 2015, um, there were adjustments and revisions made to the national curriculum. And here I'm talking about K-12. Um, to incorporate elements of sustainable development across subjects. Um, however, they were very much focused in science. Um, and despite that, teachers did not have access to any form of training. So for them to be able to deliver that knowledge effectively was really only limited to what is written in the textbook. Of course, there were outliers. There were those who were very passionate about sustainable development but in many cases, they were always in it alone. Uh, they took it upon themselves. The system that was very entrenched did not support their endeavors, so they could not really go very far. Um, so this chart here uh, is a study that was conducted by the World Bank, and I've circled in red where Malaysia stands in terms of learning poverty now, this is actually quite concerning because for a country that is at the level of development that Malaysia is at, 
and with the commitments it has made um, domestically as well as internationally, our learning poverty rate of 42% is extremely concerning. And incidentally, uh, Malaysia also has a very high child stunting rate of more than 20%, something like 21.5% of children are stunted, are stunted. And this, again, um, presents very concerning, um, a very concerning picture of what our future talent is going to look like, you know, and it is something that really has to be addressed very urgently. So um, we began with an intervention, and that intervention was really focused on teacher professional development first, because we felt that without this, nothing really can be done. The whole um, education system requires a transformation, and nobody argues with this. Everyone agrees. It is just, um, it's it's just very surprising that nothing has been done despite all of these problems being highlighted for quite some time. So we started with um, developing a five module bespoke teacher training program. We're currently piloting it in seven schools. Uh, and the way we do it is um, all the teachers of the school gets trained together. So it, it kind of fosters a whole of school approach. And uh, there, there is an interval between modules so that after each module, there's something concrete that they can try in their classroom. And when we regroup uh, in subsequent modules, we will reflect and share um, what the experiences of trying those out was. Um, there's a, a very robust monitoring and evaluation system uh, built into the, the modules. And the reason for this is we, we need to collect the evidence of the findings and successes to propose a scaling up plan to the to the Ministry of Education. Um, there are more than 10,000 schools in the country. So this is quite um, a big undertaking, which brings me then to, uh, these are what the modules are. Uh, they were highly customized to the needs of the Malaysian system. And uh, however, they can be customized again, depending on other contexts of different jurisdictions, especially around the region, but uh, it could be anywhere in the world. These are just some pictures of the training program that we're conducting. Now, the second intervention is the scaling up. Like I said, there are more than 10,000 schools in the country. Um, but from the early findings of the pilot, which you can see here on the screen, um, we have secured funding by a foundation to support the, the training of teachers in 30 more schools in the country. But again, that is not enough. Um, we need to work with the Ministry of Education to, to ensure that it is brought to every school in the country. And uh, the third intervention is influencing policy. So at the moment, um, the work that we're doing, Education for Sustainable Development, it aligns perfectly with the existing policy. However, there is no explicit mention of um, Education for Sustainable Development anywhere in the policy documents. So it is quite timely that um, the current education blueprint is coming to an end. Um, but in 2025, a new blueprint will, will be released. And we have now been appointed to be part of um, a national committee of strategic partners for ESD implementation in Malaysia. And we're, build, we're building um, a national action plan that we hope will be included in the new blueprint. And that's all from me, Paul. Thank you so much. Yeah, so that was, um, I think that was a, a very exciting announcement. We had a, a UNESCO um, SDSN kind of re regional ESD kind of co conference a few weeks ago, and the Jeffrey Shaw Foundation kindly expanded a, a lot of fun funding for uh, taking that pilot into 30 more schools and uh, doing an MOU with the Ministry of Education to actually even take it further and beyond. So congrats on all that work. Um, so I'm actually just going to invite Gary Smith. He asked, I think, a great question. Uh, you can unmute Gary and, and come on and talk. Would you do that for me? 
Oh, thank you, Professor Walsh. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the presentations. I was just curious to build on uh, the programs that are rolling out around reskilling and building skills, how we're thinking about uh, success measurements. Um, are there specific ROI levers that are in place or you think would be great to have in place that we could use to really double down and support for these types of programs? I'm not sure if it's increased earnings for folks that are participating in the in the programs or maybe time to ramp in a new role. I'd, I'd love to get folks feedback. Yeah, th that's a, a great question. I don't know, does anyone want to take that on? But it, it's really a, a great, a, a really a great, great question to whether any sort of cooperation or programs or availability, of course, how do you actually measure success or whether it's actually having an impact? Um, does anyone want to take that on? Yeah, maybe I can can do that, Paul. So yeah, yeah. on the corporate side, yeah. so how we measure it with with uh, with if we do training initiatives, uh, strategic initiatives, uh, then then we really try to see why are we doing that. So for instance, let's let's take a sustainability problem. Um, in our case, sustainability is very much linked to what do we underwrite and. And if you do something uh, and you have a risk which uh, which is some somewhat grayish, let's say you have a hydrogen project in the Amazon uh, uh, basin, and you don't know if you can underwrite that or not, uh, you will then bring that to risk management, and risk management has uh, has time to do that. And of course, you don't want to waste too much time for a decision, so you say you know we would like to have that decision made in twenty four hours, and then you try. To train the people in the risk management area that they are able to do that, and then you also measure that. So this turnaround time, or these are the things which is really the performance ultimately you would like to see in the business. Uh, so, and I think that's uh, uh, often more effective than to ask the people very happy about the sustainability risk management training. Uh, so these these are the things which we then really link to to business outcomes. Thank you, Raimo. That's excellent. Sorry, just to tell you from a more university perspective, I remember getting Irish aid money where we were to, um, you know, have an impact on education and schools. And my approach was to go in Tanzania to do say and train a lot of their staff up to PhD level because they train 6,000 teachers a year. And then when it came to impact assessment on some KPIs or something, a lot of universities just leave it at the door. You know what I mean? They train them, do their best, send them out and go, of course, this is beneficial to society. I mean, you have better trainers of, of trainers and it's actually going to hit every village in Tanzania over time. But uh, the reality is, is that we weren't tracing impact. You know what I mean? Like the way you described there on your on the business uh, pro our, kind of the risk assessment and the actuarial scientists who go in and they can track the impact, et cetera. So it's a good question that if we are, particularly governments, we are doing societal interventions like that or with corporates, like how do we, how do we know that we've actually um, succeeded or that we're, we're doing something good? And Shamir is going to ask the question. So good. Go ahead, Shamir. Yeah, uh, it, uh, to my view, thank you for the question because it's a, it's a key question, really. Um, my personal feeling is that uh, we are not there uh, yet and uh, the journey is just beginning uh, but we will have to prove uh, that what we are trying to implement of course does make a change because if not uh, what's the point right so assessing monitoring uh, the uh, progress on the impact of sustainability education is us of uh, of uh, the uh, utter importance I shared in the chat something was there's an interesting horizon project coming, which is led by the Utrecht uh, University uh, under the guidance of uh, Jelle uh, Bouve de Pau, um, which is called Impact. And precisely, it will be about assessing uh, the impact of sustainability on climate change education. Does it work? Basically, how does it change uh, the learners? And there, I would like to add something uh, regarding what you tackled before and one of your uh, very questions, uh, Paul. You, you were asking to what are the specific skills 
uh, sets to uh, the evolving labor force need to adapt for digital and stable transformation. So we know for a fact, of, uh, we think, but there are some specific skills. Green Comp is, for instance, listing the specific skills we're supposed to tackle when it comes to sustainability. And there is just, as we know for also for a fact that certain of these skills are not tackled properly in school. I'm sorry, I'm talking about school because that's where I come from. But I guess it's the same thing in the uh, in the training center. Um, system thinking is something that requires, by definition, to have another view, uh, 360, uh, on the uh, extraordinary complexity of things. If you uh, divide in silos disciplines and don't have teachers coming as a, as a working force collectively on tackling uh, that complexity, you won't get there. And most of the education systems are not done to tackle that level of complexity. I was explaining in my too long presentation, Paul, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> I forgot to look my, my clock. But that Eurydice report, which is clearly, because again, it's an assessment process on report saying, okay, does it work? And we know for a fact that the collective uh, action competence, the future literacy competence, as I explained, are not tackled enough. But these are the specific competence we need. And uh, Nikki uh, ex uh, explained the same things, huh? uh, the, uh, to, to be ready for the future. Do we do that in the education system at the moment, give these competences of the learners to be ready to face the future? Frankly, I'm not that sure about that. And I will finish that because that's what impact the horizon project I was talking about before we'll do. We have the feeling, it's more than a feeling to tell you the truth, that among the competences, the action competences, arts, are now the one really very strictly linked, which means that we, did, we need to give the possibility to the learners to know how to act. Also to act when they're learning, which means an paramount of the learners for sure, but also giving them the possibility to the agency they need to have to become the citizen professionals we need. And there, these action competences at the moment are not tackled properly in most of the education and training sector. Right. Uh, so the impact uh, project, it will last for four years, will also give us some uh, some uh, ideas uh, on that assessment process. Thinking. Yeah, very good. Uh, Elena, you had your hand out. Very good. Maybe just very quickly also to complement from the adult uh, learning and training perspective. Um, there are methods, of course, typically in our programs, we always use uh, learning evaluation. There is Kirkpatrick learning evaluation model that is um, used quite often in the uh, adult learning. And it helps you, in fact, what it encourages you to do beyond measuring um, sort of the the gains in knowledge and skills and attitudes uh, right after the uh, learning happened, uh, to look at what happens a few months down the road and the, uh, at the application of skills and knowledge, and uh, also sometimes what are the enabling factors and what are the um, impediments, why this is not happening, understanding better institutional environment, etc. Uh, but I think with uh, what we are trying to do, the larger scale initiatives you are trying to do, for example, I was talking about doing things in partnerships with many institutions, many different target audiences, stakeholder groups. I think we would need to reinvent uh, a little bit. We, we can be using a combination of quantitative and qualitative methods, maybe some uh, case studies, impact stories, not focusing only on the ones that are doing well, but also the ones maybe it's not doing well and understanding why. Uh, so I think we, we need to have something, we can leverage existing instruments, but make them more ambitious and also integrate better systems thinking and other aspects um, and tailor it to different target audiences. Nikki? Uh, yeah, I think one uh, very interesting or, or very important uh, aspect is to raise awareness. Um, of course, we need to evaluate how effective our programs or strategies are, but I think at the end of the day, the most important thing we want to do now is raise awareness of sustainable issues, anything related to the sustainable issues. And I think um, that precedes the evaluation. We need to raise awareness, and then later we have to adapt, or well, while we're raising awareness, we of course have to adapt our education systems and um, approaches in general. But I think um, 
the evaluation of whether they were successful, we will see later. But without raising awareness first, we're not going to get there. You know, if we just change the the education system without um, also actively raising that awareness among older people who are no longer going to school, and then of course the younger the, the younger ones. Maria, go ahead. All right. uh, indeed, everyone shared my thought, and I completely agree with everything that was shared. And stepping on the awareness raising, I believe, and it was part of the of the chat. That's why I stepped in. The fact that we need, and it's getting easier and easier to ensure inclusiveness of excellence. So our, our main goal as a skills and training and the education developers is to loudly speak on the fact that everything is accessible to, to all and we have the, the opportunities to to get on board everyone equal equal opportunities and i'm absolutely convinced that speaking about resilience and sustainability green and digital skills they're even even easier to, to be spread to everyone. So definitely in all our efforts, we need to never forget the, the fact that inclusiveness is, uh, is the key to, to success in everything that we're doing. Thanks. Yep, and uh, we're, we're coming near the end. So, so definitely um, the pathways of inclusiveness, you know, for, for people who drop out of school or drop out of different sectors that they can get back on board and get upskill and reskill and get back into the labor force. But also these inclusion programs have to be coherent with the digital and sustainability agenda. There's no there's no no point bringing everybody back into the labor force if they're not um, future skilled <laughs> because they or they're they're orientated somewhere else. So it's complex in that sense. And then if there are micro credentials that allow this inclusivity and coherence across voc vocational colleges and corporate training and universities, um, you know, that we always should be thinking of inclusion and uh, the, the future skills. So it's kind of complex, but it's just a mindset. Like the world out there is complex anyway, the way we do it. So it's just a matter of transforming towards another uh, com uh, uh, complexity. Um, so. I'm going to um, stick with the time because I know a lot of people are going on to the next thing. Um, so it was a joy to have everyone on the panel. It was very informative. Um, we will send the recordings and presentations to everyone who registered and for those who turned up today. Um, and uh, we hope to see you next time. Um, and hopefully um, you're inspired uh, to join some of the communities and to really start thinking about labour market resilience and partnerships um, and access. Um, so uh, thank you very much for um, coming today and uh, we'll see you, see you next time.